this is Fake the Nation presenting Succession Recaps. I'm your host, Nikki Farsada, and we are dissecting HBO's hit series, Succession. We're also selling mausoleums for the bargain basement price of $5 million. Hit me up if you're interested. And so, today, we will tackle season four, episode nine, titled Church and State. Don't be confused, this is still the FTN feed, and you will get your regular episode of Fake the Nation on Thursdays. But for today, and for the coming Monday, we will be doing this bonus Succession Recap Pod. The panel today is as impressive as the condolence line at Logan Roy's funeral. We have joining us the artist, the filmmaker, our resident Uber for wealth expert, and she who is the corpuscules of life. It is Danielle Dershlag. Hey, Danielle. Nagin, could I ask for a better introduction or day to talk about the roles? Thank you so much for having me. Um, also joining us today, oh my gosh, I'm so excited for this next panelist. She's been on Fake the Nation before. She is one of the most excellent of actors. You've seen her in so very, very many things, not the least among them, the CW series Legends of Tomorrow, which, by the way, I was with her one day when a Legends of Tomorrow fan stopped her on the street to get a selfie. It was one of those cute moments. Um, I and right them. now... <laughs> and right now she is doing a play called deep blue sea i'm sorry deep blue sound at the club thumb theater and uh she is comfortable in this world she knows it she likes it amen to tala ash hey Ooh. tala this is like the closest I'll ever be to being on Succession, so I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the closest any of us. <laughs> yeah, this is true for all of us. Um, I just want to let, let listeners know that I have some sort of an allergy attack happening right now. To, so today's show is extra phlegmy, gravelly voice, and I think very appropriate for a funeral. And with that, um, I want to just quickly um, remind listeners that they can listen to Fake the Nation on Thursdays. And perhaps you've been listening to two podcasts worth of podcasts um, off of this feed a week and you've been enjoying it. And maybe, maybe that makes you want to go to patreon.com slash Nagin Farsal to support the show even more for as little as $4 a month. You can get extra episodes of Fake the Nation. Um, you obviously already love Fake the Nation, so why not formalize it by being a Patreon subscriber? Again, that's fakethenation.com slash, sorry, that's patreon.com uh, slash Nagin Farsad. All right, and I'm going to do my typical summary that I do, but before we do that, I just want to hear some first blush thoughts. Danielle, what do you think of this episode? This was pretty close to a masterpiece for me. Um, the, Fuck yeah. <laughs> right, like the kind of uh, the rhythm of it, the the way it sort of went back and forth between really deep, uh, believable pockets of emotion and sort of like what we come to expect from the show, these wonderful kind of machinations of corporate life. I thought it got that rhythm really right. And um, it felt profound in a way that a funeral episode should. I, I loved it. Uh, Tala, what do you think? Yeah, it uh, it was a real roller coaster of emotions. Um, again, like just deftly executed. Um, mm. I li I listened to the the like after remarks with uh, Mark Mylod, and he said that they shot some of the funeral in in succession in in uh from beginning to end which blew oh, my mind it actually yeah. like they makes so much that. sense yeah. it makes so much sense because you i feel like i mean as an actor i was watching actors like in a very real way go through a funeral yes. but also i i just thought it i mean the way the the pendulum turned from roman to ken it was it brilliant oh. Just brilliant. beautiful, beautiful. Well, let's get into the summary and then we'll just uh, we'll jump into our questions. Uh, it's funeral day and the show opens on Roman practicing his, practicing his eulogy. And you know what that means? Seeing a rehearsal always means you're never going to see the actual performance. But we'll get to that because in the meantime, it's also the day after the uneasy elections and America is all protesty. Rava won't let the kids go to the funeral because she doesn't, she doesn't think it's safe. Shiv and Lucas are releasing those shitty Indian numbers, burying them amid protests and actual burials. Tom can't go to the funeral because turns out running a news channel the day after an electoral kerfuffle requires some FaceTime at the office. And the world's luminary shitty monsters and Logan's ex-wives and mistresses gather in the church to bury the hatchet. And then... This is my favorite moment. The New York Philharmonic's B team blasts a classical music version of a Katy Perry style power anthem to oddly start the funeral on a high note. 
so what weird. a needle drop. It was so weird. It was so, so bizarre. Funny. The first major bomb drop of the episode was that Uncle Ewan unexpectedly gave a eulogy where he takes a giant funeral dump on Logan. Because, you know, Logan sucked. That said, it is a weird way for an opening act to warm up the audience. Roman's up next, but don't worry. He's pre-grieved. He was absolutely pumped for this. But then when he actually takes the podium, he utterly crumbles into a pool of tears. What a fucking pussy is what I would say if I was Logan. <laughs> but because I'm Nagin, I also descended into a puddle of tears. Uh, Kendall takes the stage to deliver one of the best eulogies I've ever seen on film or television. It was a little James Joyce, a little Truman Capote, a little Meredith on Grey's Anatomy. What a brew of words. Team Morning goes to the burial where they see their dad's mausoleum McMansion and then assemble at a wake for some nosh and champagne where Kendall recruits Hugo to his team and then Logan's driver, Colin. Talk to me. Talk to me. He's clearly trying to clone his dad's setup, but Mankin is the one everyone wants to dance with at this party and Mankin does a great job of keeping everyone in play. Tom and Shiv have a tender moment. Kendall tells Roman that he fucked it, but he needs to follow Ken's lead and make some moves. Then Roman basically puts a bunch of stones into his pockets and walks into the river, by which I mean he throws himself into a protest where he gets a little battered and bruised. The end. Holy fuck! Wow, that's a, that's a lot for just over an hour of television. Right? I mean, remarkable. So let's actually start with something light. Uh, all of the ex-wives gather on the same pew, hold hands, and cry. Can we talk about the ladies of Logan moment? Yes! <laughs> Tala, what'd you think? I mean, talk about unexpected. What did she say? She said, uh, you're, you're the, um, what was the name of the old... The, the original oh, she, wife. She was my. She was my. She, she was, was my Carrie Ann. Yeah. No, she was my Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Meet my Carrie. Yeah. Just Sally Ann. This is Sally Ann. She was my <laughs> Carrie. Yeah. Right. I mean that shot of the four of them oh. sitting on the pew. My goodness. Um. Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> and also, like they've all been. Everyone's been screwed over by him. And just to see this like room, but especially those four women who in myriad ways have been screwed over by literally i suppose uh, uh by logan yeah. <laughs> was oh, just wow and how incredible it's so weird because the Ma carolyn caroline is um so unfeeling and horrible to her own children but managed to like really muster up a well of empathy for these women <laughs> well it's yeah. like what I actually, I was really surprised but delighted by that. You know, Succession will not let a single characteristic stand for any character, which is what I love about the show. Everyone's too human for that. They aren't just one thing. This woman has been pretty close to like a Cinderella scenario, Wicked Stepmom kind of vibe for the entirety of the series. Yes, And here yes. we see her extend herself with a level of generosity and care that no one's expecting, right? Which of course, we all contain multitudes and funerals can bring out the mushies and the gushies, right? So like it, it made sense to me and I believed it that moment that shot of the four of them yeah. really what I've been waiting for that shot for a long time um <laughs> this, the way that the way this episode played with the poor treatment of women I thought was really kind of throughout and fascinating it starts with Rava being attacked by Kendall we mm -hmm. get to the funeral where these sort of women who were his lovers and partners get relegated to this one pew even in that moment when you know Shiv is talking about you know he was hard on women right? It's acknowledged so much here. We even hear it, you know, when uh, Matson's giving his personal philosophy, I think it was privacy, pussy, and pasta. You know, misogyny is a real through line <laughs> on this piece, right? And to have this world that is so sexist and harmful to women within that landscape, to get to see these four women show some dignity, connection, and support for each other, I loved it. Beautiful. You know what? We're going to get to more questions, but first, let's take a quick break, and then we'll be back. And we are back, uh, folks. Let's um, get into it with two moments from. Uh, we're, we're like, I want to get to the eulogies as its own special piece, but first, Kendall's long-suffering assistant wants to quit, so Jess has a moment with him. She didn't want to have it, but he kind of forces it. Like, what is this meeting, man? I want to quit. Um, and that was weird, he, you know. And of course, that comes off the heels of him having the, a really um, just terrible interaction with his ex ex wife and an SUV representing his children. Um, 
Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Danielle, um, I don't know. Uh, first of all, I can't believe Jess. Why did it take you so long to quit? Was there a pension? You were waiting for the pension to kick in? Like you have been suffering on this job. It is an all hours, always on call, dealing with um, the just oscillating, unexpected emotions of a billionaire all the time. How did you last so long? I I would not have. Um, what what did you make of, of these moments? Well, I have to say, um, this is really, a moment that where wealth culture I think has an explanation right I totally understand why she stayed so long and I also understand why she it is so hard for her to leave you know in that moment did you see in her eyes she is trying so hard to not say the truth she is trying with all of her human might to not say well Kendall the reason I'm quitting is because you're emotionally and logistically abusive and you've brought down the republic and democracy and I'm a person of color and a woman and I don't want to participate anymore that's what I saw behind her eyes. What she's saying is, it's time. It's time. <laughs> yeah. Those are the actual words, right? In that moment, what we're seeing, and wealth culture does this all the time, you know, the closer you get to the sun, meaning like whoever the first generation of wealth is in these dynastic cultures, the more power and the more danger. Jess knows that unless she leaves in a way where it feels like Kendall's idea, and he's not offended at all and doesn't take it personally. By the way, none of those are possible. But the fantasy is that she'll be able to leave in that way unless she does. If she leaves with any negative feelings on Kendall's part, he will fuck her somehow. Yeah, yeah. He now knows this culture. You don't get out lightly. That's why I always yeah. say the mafia is such a good analogy for these 1% family clans. You know, you can get in with a lot of work. Getting out? very hard, especially clean in a way that doesn't harm you. I think Jess is a smart person. She knows that. And that's why this is the least crisply verbalized why I'm leaving speech we've ever heard. She can't tell this guy the truth because even telling him a non-truth, he throws a tantrum and that tantrum could be dangerous for her down the line. Can I also just say, I mean, all of that is absolutely true. And then there's the other just normal reality. I mean, I was in a situation where I was at a job that was like, I should have quit this job and I needed the paycheck. Like I oh, just sure. needed, you know, cause I, I knew I was kind of going to go into comedy. Comedy was not a paycheck and I needed to figure it the fuck out. And when you're, I don't know how old Jess is, let's say she's like 30. Um, you're dealing with your, you know, money. And also those assistants are paid very handsomely. Like mm -hmm. they're not, they're also earning a lot of money. They're also edging into a percentile of wealth with their income, you know? Um, so it is, there's some golden handcuffs that are also involved. So there's like this whole world of, of you know, you, she also needs just a simple recommendation letter for her next job. You know what I mean? She right. needs all that stuff. There's like the simple stuff. There's like the big, you know, kind of geopolitics of it all. Um, but it was so interesting. And of course, this is where Kendall shows his colors because he was like, thanks for bringing it up now. You know, <laughs> you're like, you he was, yeah, he was like, asshole. I gave you so much access. I gave yeah. you so much access. <laughs> Weren't you waiting for her to finish that sentence to abuse? Yeah. It's like, right, right, right. Access to what? Yeah, I also think it's telling that like this character that has been with us for so many episodes, so many seasons, she's gotten her two biggest scenes in the previous uh, episode with Greg and in this scene with Kendall. Like this is the most she's been allowed to speak and like from something yeah. that she's trying to say from her heart or from her desires. And even then she's, I mean, I think it, it goes along with like how women are treated also in this world and specifically women of color. This is one of the only people of color in this show. Correct. And like, this is what she gets just in terms yeah. of screen time. I think that's telling. Such a good point. Yeah. I also want to say the moment with the SUV. Um, oh, you know how I'm a Kendall apologist, basically. Oh, is this time. continuing, the game? Can I stop <laughs> you? <laughs> no, I was just thinking, okay, this is all I was thinking. I totally get what that rabbit was just like, I got to go. It's not safe. I also get that he was so, he's like, it's my dad's funeral and my children aren't going to be there. Like, I can also picture myself standing in front of an SUV and be like, what if I just throw my body down in front of this SUV and just start saying crazy things? Like, I can picture if my ch my children couldn't go to my parents' funeral, 
um that Nikki, I would just come like, go on. crazy. Nikki, Nikki, <laughs> I, no, but I can, I can us, picture Nikki. going crazy. I'm but, just saying. Yes, but you're taking all the other, you know, context out of it. Like yes. you're a no, good parent. I mean, I, when Ken no, was like, I, I'm going to go for custody, her. I was like, oh, no, no, no. Good obviously, God. that's insane. No, obviously, that's insane. And obviously, I think many judges will also find that insane. <laughs> I hope so. Um, I don't know. God, money. I hope. I, there's a lot of power coming from that guy. Mm-hmm. And listen, I, I'm not even sure he's going to follow through on that. I think he's having grief tantrums throughout this episode. I'm not, but, but, but let me say this the, you know, we're watching Ken grief cal- tantrums. Yeah. Yeah. We're watching Kendall calcify, calcify into Logan over the course of this episode, I would argue we're also watching Shiv do a similar dance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, you know, him standing there and and really being certain that he can control and power his way out of his ex-wife's agenda, which is to keep their children safe. That's so classic Logan thinking, but the critical difference is Logan would have stopped them. Yeah. Kendall says, I'm going to lie down in front of this car and they just drive away. So, you know, I thought this episode did a really interesting thing where it's showing us how ineffectual Ken can be in an actual real world scenario where he's upset and how effectual he can be on a stage giving a kind of public presentation. When it comes to the behind the scenes stuff where the real action happens, he doesn't do great. And this scene is an example of that. Um, I also just wanted to point out one thing from a filmmaking perspective. I don't know if you two noted this, but sometimes I'm so floored by what Succession doesn't show. But what succession lets us imagine, and I loved the choice to not have a shot from inside that car. We're mm-hmm. imagining what those children are experiencing yeah. as their parents fight and Ken bangs on the window, but we don't see it. And in some ways, the vision of that in our heads, I think, is worse and more powerful. And succession is so good about choosing those moments where it lets us fill in the blanks. That was one of those for me. In a very, very I, different way. I feel the same yeah. way about when we hear about Greg's night with Madsen and drink, yes. drinking things you shouldn't be drinking and just yes, imagining no that. And you're like, what the, what the fuck happened? Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh, we never like, should have really seen pictured, that. I'm so glad. I really glad. pictured like a slow dance to like a really... Yeah like I don't know like a like a Tony Bennett tune and then they were just kind of like and how weird anyways I don't know whatever what what everyone else imagined when that story came out but I will say about the kids I also think about the practicalities that are involved in filmmaking and um having directed children um a it's a nightmare but also (laughs) uh, b the like rules around having children on set and the um, education part and all the stuff that they have to do it's like um you anything you can do to not have the children on set you do that thing um and if that just means keeping the windows of the suv closed you know it's funny because i mean i do think they're masters right like i'm not trying to say they aren't but they also have to deal with practicalities of filmmaking, even though True. they probably are given a gajillion dollars. Um, but I can also see practical decisions being made uh, on a set like that. But it, it was funny because it was just like, this SUV is children, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it was just a funny way to, to look at it. But let's jump into the actual funeral. Um, so, um, you know, after um, that rousing um, mute pr- performance um, from the, the the Boston Pops or whatever came out <laughs> to do so it. weird. Nagina got a great deal on the Boston Pops. You won't believe the deal they got. Well, they were doing a uh, Ray, you know, off the rack Reagan is what That's they right. were doing. That's um, right. <laughs> so, so, so Ewan gives gets up and gives an unexpected eulogy they didn't want him to obviously because they knew he was going to say some bad shit um i can i just say one little thing that has been driving me crazy about this entire series Hmm. logan's accent indicates so they were like four or five when they came to america four and five and a half we now know yeah what were these accents and why doesn't Ewan have the same accent as Logan? Ewan just speaks like he's an American. Logan speaks like he spent uh, half of his life in Scotland, right? So, like, what is happening? And I just want to say that for the record, this is one detail that I felt was inconsistent in Succession Land. Like, for a show that got that gets everything right. Uh, okay, that's a dumb nitpick. That said... <laughs> 
I, you and really also kept this thing going of generational trauma, right? Because he sh- shares a story that basically Logan had been, um, uh, basically thought he killed his sister with polio the, his whole life. And none of the adults in the family tried to correct this abuse him of that notion. Um, what did you guys make of this, uh, of the you and eulogy, ta- uh, Tala? I mean, I, 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 th- I thought that it was so brilliant to, like, I knew something was going to derail Roman, mm. but the fact that it was this and uh, somebody had to say the truth. Again, as you said, we were never going to see that rehearsal version, but I thought it was such a brilliant way to bring that bit of backstory that we've, you know, we've, I think we all, I, I've certainly like pathologized Logan to try to be like, why is he, why is he this way? But to just get this like little tidbit at a funeral in this moment where, you know, there are revelations that can come out about people that like Danielle was saying, like they're never one thing. And, and just like seeing that land on Roman and then what happens I just thought was such a such a really true and brilliant setup. Like it it didn't feel like I didn't feel manipulated as the viewer, you know? Yeah, Danielle. You know, I want to take a moment of just robust praise for James Cromwell, the actor who does this part. Because in that speech, as brilliantly written as it is, I also felt in his performance of it, his embodying of it, such an believable mix of sorrow, loss, rage, disappointment, and care. Yeah, yeah. You know, not an easy list of stuff for an actor to really sell in such a brief period of time. James Cromwell is an incredible performer to watch on screen. As I was watching, I felt relief, frankly, that someone was going to point out that Logan was ultimately a powerful shitbag. I needed that to happen publicly. And, and in some ways, I think within the world of this show, it might be the closest to something we'd call justice. <laughs> like we're never going to see what I really want to see, which is these people fully brought down. But seeing his brother, the person who arguably knows him best in the room, who grew up with Logan, one person who's left, this guy, to see him really name both the trauma and I think he said, um, I, I wrote it down, but it was something like he wrought terrible things. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Just to yeah. have that said strongly and clearly. Uh, was very relieving. I also want to give props from a filmic point of view to to like the reaction shots of Roman we see during that speech. As you're watching Roman's face while the brother is talking, you know something has dramatically shifted that is going to impact what happens today. Um, I thought it was pretty magnificently done by everybody involved. And also just to say, you know, Nagin, as you are a Kendall apologist, as you know, I like to take big verbal dumps on these people. So we have different orientations. But like, as someone who's a Roy dumper, I guess I'll call myself, um, it was also lovely and touching to remember that like all of us, Logan was hurt. Yeah. Right? It doesn't all come from, you know, he didn't pop out of Zeus's head as a motherfucker. He was deeply He's and yet. aggressively hurt. And the remembering that The motherfucker was molded. That's yeah. Right. Um, I it was it was so remarkable and also i mean the the great thing it's the great thing about how they handled everything about roman which we can come to now is that they really set him up like he's on top of the fucking world it's discord it makes my dick hard <laughs> like it's he was just like he had quips he was making disgusting jokes about yeah. shiv's baby being his oh, and like oh. um and like jacking off to his sister uh um breastfeeding i mean he was prime roman right he was just going for it fully and you knew that that level like being on a cocaine high at, at right. that level cannot be sustained and it's like we it's like they gave us this i can't get over it i know philharmonic crescendo <laughs> to, <laughs> to like guys it's about to fucking break you know what i mean Love and it. then roman takes that stage realizes too that his dead dad is in the coffin which is a thing he's never really been able to uh fathom and and he just can't give that speech and essentially in that moment of like having humanity how dare he also 
utterly fucks himself. Whoever wears the crown, it will definitely not be Roman. Correct. He can't fucking handle it. Guys, Tala, talk to me about Roman. Yeah, he loses everything in that moment. And that was that's when I was crying. I what watching mm. him was when I mm. actually lost it cuz this he's he's such a he's such a nihilistic person. But again, this he has this humanity that comes out in this moment where you're like this is a disgusting human who I would hate to be in a room with. However, at his father's funeral, like he he's he's he struck with the reality that like all of us will experience at some point of like that kind of loss that is inescapable and to like also just like see how men can treat him after like it is it is a real horror show and I think also like exactly what succession is about which is that like if you're you like cannot survive as a vulnerable person in this world Correct. and it is like it is a lose-lose situation and that's that's what the show's about. And, and it's because they're so good at making it, like it's fascinating to watch. It's also funny because there's just like acceptable levels of emotion in these situations. Like I think back to when Obama went on TV to talk about um, the massacre at Newtown and, and he, mm. you know, he delivered an address, but he also cried like a little it's like he sort of defined acceptable levels of male emotion yeah and he sang he sang right and he, he sang sing? right yes, so he like, did he had it's like he had to have the motion be a leader and 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 then be a leader of emotion um at the same time and it's like if you can do that then you're allowed to have the emotion <laughs> you have to like perform it well you i think you have to and... perform it well Ultimately, like Roman just doesn't have the stuff. He just doesn't have it. Danielle. Oh my what God. a if I also what a fucking performance. I mean, Holy fuck. Get oh the fuck my. out of here. And by the oh, way, yeah. a, a version of that character, a kind of place, emotional place for that character, we've never seen. I mean, nothing even close, right? To see him fall that hard that publicly. I just want to point out one thing from a wealth culture perspective, which is, and this does speak to some of my history growing up, you know, in wealth culture, any event can be turned into a corporate meeting. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. We've seen that with these people, like it's their job, weddings, corporate meeting, right? Every time. This time we're at the death ritual. And again, it's truly a corporate meeting. Partly why Roman is is now off the throne forever is because he has sort of, you know, totally failed to meet the moment. He's supposed to give a speech. And he's also failed this very fucked up version of masculinity that this society believes in. But the other reason why he's failed is because he's not really giving a funeral speech. He's giving a corporate ascendance speech masquerading as a funeral speaker, mm. right? These people could turn a liver transplant into a corporate reshuffling meeting. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's just, that's what's in the air always. So I also was struck by, there's so many deals and machinations happening at this funeral around the edges of the grief, right? When Roman bursts into tears, the reason why it feels like failing and not like just a normal son who's overcome with emotion is because we also know he's auditioning. Yeah. He's auditioning yeah. for the crown. Um, that's so fucked up. <laughs> like, yeah. Just to say, imagine, God forbid, you're at your parents' funeral and you're also thinking, this speech I give about mom or dad is really going to land me in the head seat of our company. It's just not how humanity should function, which is why that moment is so potent, I think. And and Kendall set that up in episode three. He was like, everything we do right now with the death, our, the death of our father is going to be scrutinized. It's going to be what's in the history books. And Kendall right. has known this from like moment one. That's what he was. He was groomed again. <laughs> Oh, Kendall, <laughs> Tim, Kendall, what? I know I, he's a horrible <laughs> monster. He's a horrible monster. I'm so aware. Um, but he has been groomed. He's been groomed. He knows. He gets it. He 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 understands who's watching at all times. Right? He is. He's like. He's like the um, method extra in the background, who's just always playing a character. <laughs> Just waiting for the moment that they might throw him like one line. Like he's that guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's, let's talk about that, that eulogy because 
I mean, here's the, okay, again, nitpicking with the a succession here, a nearly perfect show. Um, He fucking delivers one of the most beautiful, like, eulogies, because it was also, he did paint the picture of a brute. Yes. Right? He called his father a brute. Like, he, he, he did mention the money, right? Like, he mm-hmm. said the sort of all the, all the, like, unmentionables, he mentioned them but still managed to put bring together this, you know, beautifully poetic um, words for his father. And my nitpick is that like, that couldn't have been improvised. My, fi- obviously, like, obviously it was written by amazing writers, right. but, um, but in terms of the character, I can also picture a world that I told myself that Kendall was just like, in case I need to hop up there. Mm. let me have some thoughts prepared uh because there was just a little too much corpuscules of life <laughs> in the dialogue for me it's just not something that agree. rolls off the tongue like in an improvisational way I mean Tala what did you think I I would agree when I like as an actor when I saw him as an actor taking the note cards with a pencil I was like what are we doing what are we doing yeah. <laughs> this is not <laughs> You're gonna do like a, a quick like like edit. <laughs> Come on, you're not Come gonna on, say yeah. that. Yeah, it felt a little bit. It, it it yeah. I would I would agree with you. It felt if I'm gonna be nitpicky, it felt a little bit rehearsed. Um, I don't think that the actor could have you know solved that necessarily. Um, it but we also needed those words. You know, we needed yes. to hear him say those words. So I I allow it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, I mean, um, you, you said it, but like the, it's a, the, the, the bringing it back to the money and naming that actually, I was, I found that really, really surprising because it's like this entire show and especially actually this episode, it's like, it's capitalism. Right. And it's like what yes. capitalism, like end stage capitalism turn can turn into. I mean, certainly what we're seeing in this country, it's like fucking chaos while like people are in like nice SUVs and like trying to get down the street and like wearing their you know expensive things that they're at the funeral with the boston pops playing their jaunty song like but the background is like failed capitalism that they that these guys don't really care about they're like money money is king money is king it's always been king and he named it which i thought was really interesting yeah like there's really no other reason that all those luminaries would be there for, were it not for money of course um now kendall's uh, speech felt utter- utterly rehearsed however shiv's eulogy yes. did feel like an off the cuff thing that a, you know and i think she sort of said like office or whatever to like kendall she did as a like oh i'm going to go up there and riff on on our on our office stories when we, from when we were little. Uh, Danielle, what did you make of Shiv's eulogy? I was really blown away by all the performances here. This is no exception. I felt that, her, you know, listen, I agree it, precisely with what you two have said about this uh, Kendall speech. Over, you know, overwritten, like, like, how could he have come up with that? And and I loved it, right? So, like, <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, but, but, I, but I those things are true. Yeah. Right. Um, with Shiv, it did feel organic. Um, it did feel sort of um, moving and real and from her person. I will say, you know, of all things, because I do come from a bizarro kind of smaller version of this world, it reminded me of a story about my grandma. We grew up in a in her going to her apartment, which had a massive, important art collection. And sometimes we would dare each other to touch one of the paintings. And which was verboten. Touching a painting in that room was like setting a fire. And we did it to get her attention. But we also did it because we were scared of her. That moment, you know, I remember when my one of my cousins was caught touching one of these master paintings and what happened. Um, in families like this, these moments are real. They exist. And they are a kind of complicated bunch of stuff in terms of memory and how you think of someone, because I think of my grandmother who was the doyen of my family as this powerhouse and someone I was both scared of and loved. And if I were somehow giving a speech about her, I could imagine sharing that painting story to talk about both her kind of zest for life and culture and capacity to sort of build worlds and collections and also the ways that she kept us out. So I just want to say, speaking from a bizarro 1% perspective, I believe that story like it's my job. 
Um, mm, and I yeah. thought, and I thought that Shiv sold it beautifully. I also just want to quickly, I, I wrote this down. This is really the most perfect encapsulation for me of, of when it comes to a, a portrait of Logan from a woman's perspective. When he let you in, when the sun shone, it was warm. It was warm in the light, but it was hard to be his daughter. He was hard on women. I'm not sure we've heard that acknowledged by someone before in this show. We've seen it. It's been shown to us. But to have it verbalized from his one female offspring, I thought was a really powerful and exciting choice. Oh, my God. And yes. then she goes on to say, I believe she goes on to say right after that, he couldn't fit a whole woman in his head. Yes. And I, thought, mm. and I, and I was like, that's it. Oh, that's all of it. To me, that's right. he couldn't fucking put t- a fully dimensional single woman into his head. Uh, right. And that was um, the pew of mistresses and wives. Yes. Uh, like who were three dimensional, who, who cried for him, you yes. know? Yes, he couldn't. He couldn't actually acknowledge that any of them were full human beings, and that's fucking crazy and amazing. And the kid, can um, I just give you my quick moment of what I love yeah. that point really coming across? When Kendall says he made us, and the yes! camera cuts to Kendall's mom with this look on her face, like, "Did he fucking make you?" Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> that was a great shot. Wasn't that a great shot? Oh my god, so amazing. Okay, well, let's move away from the before we run out. At a time, let's move away from the funeral and on to the uh, well, they had this little hilarious Mick, Mick mausoleum moment, um, which is just uh, you know, the pet supply guy, um, d- you know, decided against the mausoleum, so then uh, Logan bought it up. Um, you know, Connor might take the top bunk, um, but <laughs> then they go to the is that awake the thing that happens after the funeral where you have food was it the what is that thing called oh, i think it's a the gathering i don't oh, no. know i'm iranian but i know the muscles on this zoom <laughs> we're the wrong ones to ask Nikki. i know we're not the we're wake, not the wake <laughs> the wake okay thank so you. Like, okay, thank you <laughs> uh, producer andrew mcguire folks coming in with these critical terms um <laughs> so at the wake um which I also love that there was champagne at the wake. Anyway, that was just a really, maybe it was Prosecco. Um, the, there was a lot going on here politically. Like this, again, speaking to your point about um, everything could be a corporate meeting. Danielle, this felt like such a ridiculous, this felt like, you know, a corporate meeting meets um, a political meeting. Uh, because Megan is just like hanging out at a table which is also oddly funny because I don't think he would ever be alone for more than like three seconds as the theoretical president elect. Um, And uh, he's hanging out there and then everyone's basically trying to go up to him and be like, me, me, but what about me? You know? And uh, of course, even cousin Greg. Fucking Um, cousin Greg. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me, Tala, what did you... He it does. does. It's been hard I've, for him. Been, I've been on a real journey with Greg, but like I, I was so tickled with him at the beginning of the series. And I've just come to be like, you are actually, you're actually the worst one. You are, you are, you're the weakest, like power wise and like as a, as a person, like you, you are <laughs> like the, you're a cockroach. You're just like, you are truly the worst character on this show. And yeah, I don't know. I, I, I uh, yeah, I, I've come, I've come to, I think I used to find a lot more delight in Greg and something about him has like become very, very grating, especially in this season where I'm like, it's, it's a little like I, too. Ugh. It, I totally agree with you because he, so I mean, part of what's interesting is like we saw someone kind of like represent regular America. There's like a person in the beginning, and then throughout the series, you learn that he doesn't represent regular America. He represents a person that has actually no ethical or ideological spine at all whatsoever. That's He's right. just right. a piece right. of clay who learns mm-hmm. that money, money is comfortable, and right. and it's and he is and he he is just like human garbage. Um, I also like don't believe that he's competent in any way. Like that's the other thing that's frustrating about him. It's not like he shows his value in any situation. He's like incompetent in every situation. Oh, he, he has there. He has one competency that really matters in this world. 
he can kiss anyone's ass. Oh, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. It, does it work? Well, he's still around. I mean, yeah, listen, I, I, right. share, I share your perspective. I think he's disgusting. In fact, I would call him a <laughs> disgusting brother, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, I, he, what, what Greg provides for these people is priceless, which is that he never says no to a task. And he always asks, you know, do you need some more kisses on your tushy? So so in that way, I think he matters. And, and it explains his sticking around. I just want to point out that great moment where after he's tried to stop his uncle or his grandpa, his grandpa from getting up and giving this talk, right? Logan's brother. The guy sits down after just shitting on Logan publicly. And what does Greg say? Really strong, hard take. So yeah. <laughs> Part that, yeah, I died. That was <laughs> he can't stop himself. But, but Nagib, to go back to this sort of make it moment, um, there were you know it's not a particularly funny succession episode. It was very yeah. dark for obvious reasons. There aren't a lot of laugh lines. There's some. I just cannot stop myself from pointing out this small moment that made me laugh so hard I could have pooped myself, which is when <laughs> Mankin comes toward um, Matson. You know, Shiv sort of leading him over because she's finally pulled him away from the scrum of her siblings. And do you guys remember what Matson's first word is? To Mankin? <laughs> like, hey, uh, Vilcomen. Oh, <laughs> wow. It was a subtle moment, but it I was really say, quiet. Like, yeah. You know, you're trying to win over this guy and, and let him know that you're his friend, you're someone he can trust. And your first thing you say to him is a joke about him being a Nazi. Incredible. Absolutely. Also, incredible. also <laughs> funny that Matt, when, when Greg walks over to Matson, uh, Matson goes, hey, sexy, or something I like know. that. <laughs> Which was just hilarious to me. Um, but also, let, let's talk about who Mankin really wants, right? Like, I think Mankin did an excellent excellent job of just not saying very much at all in this episode. Doing a lot of, like, looking and nodding and clearly showing... I mean, it, it's clear that his connection with Roman is over, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ken still knows it. Everybody knows it um roman knows it right roman is basically at the at the kids table like literally at that thing it just feels like he's kind of like on his own he's got nothing um and and um and and shiv makes this like very intense introduction there you know th this is the moment where mattson basically describes his political philosophy as privacy pussy pasta which then um which shiv then uh interprets as anarcho-capitalist parmigiana uh, which I thought was really fun. Yes. Um, and Mencken, he, look, he's also a political player. He is, you know, he is not the most, he, look, yeah, I mean, he'll quote H, right? But um, he doesn't, <laughs> like, he doesn't, he's not, like, so strict in his own, he knows that he's there to just win things. Mm -hmm. um, so who to him is seeming like the winning team? I think it's him plus Madsen blocking the kids out. Wow. You know, it made no sense to me whatsoever, that phone call from Madsen to Shiv at the end of the episode where he says, yeah, Mankin's in. Basically, it's you and me. From Mankin's perspective, how does that make sense? Shiv is ideologically absolutely opposed to him. She can yeah. say she's flexible, but he, he knows, knows and that. He knows that. He's yeah. not an idiot. And we've already heard Kendall quite correctly cite that his and Roman's collective dick is in this man's hand. Mankin is the one who has control over them. From Mankin's perspective, the strong move is get these kids out of it. You and me, you and me, I, I also say, see pasta privacy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'll say that like Mankin, I'm sorry, that Matson doesn't have necessarily all the control in that scenario because Shiv has the <laughs> Ebba leaders of blood knowledge. Correct. Although Shiv has not used any of that insider knowledge at all. You know, we, but, she, but that's the out. thing. I mean, that's the thing. You, that's why you always just threaten it so that nothing right. bad happens. I mean, I don't know. Like, uh, uh, Tala, who do you think is, I mean, at this point, they're really get like, we have one episode left. <gasps> it is a 90 minute episode. Yes. I know. I'm so sad. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I can't believe it. Um, I know. Like, I don't what, know. How, I mean, how they're is this shaking out for you. I don't know. I mean, I'm so torn. Uh, there's something in my gut that says it's not going to be Kendall. I don't know why. I just, I just think it, it would be too obvious in a way. Huh. But also, I think that there, like, actually, all the 
conversation and comments about uh, how women are treated in this world and sort of the, the anti-feminism of this world, femi feminism of this world suggests that it's not going to be Shiv either. So Danielle, I'm, I'm intrigued by that proposal. I'm very intrigued by that. I, I you know, again, know. there's a world where like the board comes in with Madsen and I don't know. It's Jerry. Jerry is queen. <laughs> I guess that would be one, but you know, but I, 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 I really don't know. I'm, I'm like, I'm definitely team Shiv if I had to pick, but, mm. um, also I, I, this is maybe controversial. I love Madsen. I mean, he's also a, a, the scum of the earth scum. But <laughs> yes, I, yeah, I, yeah. I think I'm, I, I shouldn't say I love Madsen. I'm so enamored uh, of Alexander Skarsgård and how he's played this character. Yes, oh, brilliant. So weird, but, Ugh, uh, believable. but makes believable. Exactly. Like it shouldn't make sense, but it, I mean, when he like walked across the tarmac without shoes, I was just like, I love him. I don't know. <laughs> it's my, yeah, he's it's so my toxic Kendall. He's my toxic Kendall. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's so disgusting. He yeah. like completely... And it's, it's funny because I don't know if this is ever happened to you guys, but I feel like Matson and Mencken both like resemble men that I've met at bars, right? That I've like, you know, in my twenties that I made that are good, handsome, right? Yeah. I've made, yeah. I've made out with them, you know? Yeah. And yeah, then yeah, let's yeah. say <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning, they'll say something just about, you know, crypto oh we didn't have crypto <laughs> but like they'll say something that you're like ew did I just make out with you and you're the weirdest fuck and then you like cut and run like that is like that they're so it, it's like for them to be able to like chameleon like come into a situation and, and seem normal and seem charming it's such a it reminds me so much of like mistakes I've made um I would I, agree I, I, I don't totally know there's agree. there's that like enigmatic quality that yeah that and right. turns and you're like oh you're actually the worst that there is yeah. and I, I couldn't <laughs> see it at first <laughs> I know because like the air of it originally is like I'm sitting on a significant mystery for you to solve young lady That's and right. then it turns yes. out the mystery is what does that man's blood look like frozen yeah, 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 exactly. To you. So disgusting. So, like, not great. Yeah. Well, and then the <laughs> final, the, the final moment of the show um, was that Roman walks into that protest and gets beaten up. Uh, look, there's some feelings out there that maybe they kill him off screen or whatever. I don't think it's that kind of show. No, so no. I don't think any of that is true. Will we see a black eye? It's possible. Um, but, uh, but. But I think Roman takes a significant backseat on whatever the next episode is, which theoretically is not in the Caribbean because they uh, they've rejected the air clear, um, oh, right. right? Their mother's air clear invitation. But like I don't know, there could be some Caribbean um, vibes in the next episode. Uh, I don't I I don't know. I mean, I do have a question. Do, yeah. what, what are your feelings in terms of the time jump that's going to happen right now? Do we think it's the next day or like how much in the future? Because we've gone, the last three episodes have been three days, right? Right, right. right. So whatever, how yeah. far or what, you know, ish. Yeah. I'm just curious, like how much time is going to go forward? It's so annoying. I and mean, there's so many things to, so many um, loops that, that have to be closed up. I mean, the PGN deal is still out there. What's oh, going God. on, guys? Um, uh, the, uh, obviously the, um, uh, you know, Matt's and stuff, the presidency still in the balance. Um, mm -hmm. there's a lot that have to, has to be closed up, but there isn't like, in a, they didn't like signal to an event that would be that kind of forces us into it all. So but I'm actually, not sure. isn't well, the presidency an interesting thing? Like didn't, uh, maybe I'm, I'm not misremembering this, but I remember somebody saying like three months that there's like three months of things that have to happen in order for them to determine who's president. I, maybe that's completely wrong, but it feels like Mencken needs to be president in order to sort of pick the king. Interesting. That's a really good point. Yeah, I don't know. We did see scenes from the next episode sort of teased after this one, and they seem to be very boardroom heavy. 
So it's probably at least partially like a boardroom, final boardroom showdown. Well, board I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Can I just say a quick thing about that protest scene? Nagin? You know, sometimes when I'm watching Succession with my sort of filmmaker hat on, as I've mentioned, I'm so impressed by what they don't do as well as by what they actually do. In a shittier version of this show, I'm interested if you two agree, someone in that protest crowd would have gone, hey, that's Roman Roy. Let's get him. <laughs> and then they would have beaten the shit Sorry. out of him. You know, yeah. but, that, yeah. this, but this show is so much more closely tethered to reality that it knows that that number one probably wouldn't happen. And number two, like Roman's not a famous guy. He's not no on one the news all the time. Like. No yeah. one knows what he looks like. So he's, he's just totally... a fucking crazy fuck. Yeah, right. it's but yelling I was, in the wind. I was really pleased that it ended that way because, you know, one of the things this show does so successfully is portray the hermetically sealed world of the 1% and how what's happening out just outside the door, just outside the window, rarely actually comes inside, right? By Roman doing this sort of nihilistic self-defeating dance because he's fucked up, by him sort of entering this crowd, you know, it's the closest we come to one of these characters actually witnessing the stakes in person. Mm -hmm. And even though he's doing it from a place of emotional sort of, I would say, um, destruction, it still was a relief to me that one of yeah. these characters actually experienced the protest as opposed to watching it on a screen and calling it, and I believe this is a quote on Tom's part, Tiana Nini? Like, like Tiana Nini. Yeah, Tiana Nini. Nini. Yeah, yeah, Tiana yeah. Nini, yeah. Um, you know, just that word is such an insult to what's happening outside. I was glad the show actually showed us one of these one percenters having to deal with the consequence in real time, even for only a few minutes. Yeah. Um, look, we really have to end the show, even though we could probably continue talking for like literally another hour. Um, but I want to just point out one moment that I thought was so funny that made me laugh when Peter Munyon is there. He's like so excited to be at this funeral. And then he goes, <laughs> daddy's here. And I just... <laughs> So anyways, um, on that <laughs> note uh, of daddy's here, I, um, we need to, we need to close the show and I would love for the people of Faith Nation to be able to follow you and all the wonderful things that you do. Where, where do they do that? Danielle Dirchlog. Thanks so much, Nagin. I always love being here. Um, you can see my website, which is daniellederschlag.com and on Instagram, and on Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> They're coming. Uh, one percent, guys. <laughs> um, on, on, on Instagram, I'm at ddurch, which is D-D-U-R-C-A. And I would love to hear what you thought of this episode. And Tala, where do they find you? Um, oh, like hopefully nowhere. I'm trying to hide from the world, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm I'm at I'm at at Tala Ash with an E on Twitter and Instagram. Sometimes I'm there. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, and she there. She's wonderful. If you have a chance to see her perform in Deep Blue Sound, please go do that. Um, and as for me, you know where to find me. Also, I'm on this week's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. So check, tune into that if you want to hear. I um, love listening to you on that, by the way. Oh, same. You, it's so the much. best. So great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Faith and Nation will be coming back to you on Thursdays, of course. As always, we have such an excellent episode cooked up for you this week. And also, you can go to patreon.com slash Nadine Farsat to support the show. I want to thank everyone who makes this show a possibility wonderful producer Andrew McGuire. Our fantastic theme music was written by Gabby Alter. Thanks to everyone at HeadGum who makes the show happen. And folks, if you need to contact me with any ideas, we are at fakethenationpodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's fakethenationpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, we are cooking up another series of recaps. Um, so get your votes in for what you want to see next. I have a very, I have like a decent idea of what's going to come next, but I'm still open to ideas. So fakethenationpodcast at gmail.com. And I'm so uh, excited to be back in your earballs on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs>